Have you ever tried to use the planar tracker that's in DaVinci Resolve Fusion? You get the perfect shape, you hit the track forward button, and then nothing happens at all? It didn't continue tracking and tracking because it's confused. It has no detail to work with. Well, today I'm going to share with you a visual effects trick that uses frequency separation to potentially track the previously untrackable. I think this shot right here is a good example of when you might want to use frequency separation for the planar tracker. And that's because this foreground here is what I want to track. I want to occlude or take care of this occlusion for the background because maybe I want to change something in the background. I need to hold out the tree. But there's not much detail. It's defocused. There's motion blur. In fact, I'll show you how bad this works if I load the planar tracker in by default. So it's just uh, shift space, PTRA is the planar tracker. I'm going to start on the first frame, 338. I will just click a shape around the tree. Shift O to close it. I'm going to go over here to my planar tracker tool, hit set, which basically locks in that frame 338 as my reference. And then under tracker type, point, sure, that's fine. But motion type, I'm going to make this as basic as possible. Just translation. Translation just means the up, down, left, right movement. It's basically the same as a point tracker, a single point tracker as far as data is concerned. But it's able to use this whole surface area to try to get that data as accurate and smooth as possible. But the thing is, is if I come over here and I hit the tracking forward button, you see it just went one frame. It didn't, it didn't continue tracking and tracking because it's confused. It has no detail to work with. So the frequency separation is actually really simple. Even if you're a beginner to tracking in DaVinci Resolve Fusion, you're going to be able to learn this today in just a couple minutes. So we're going to use two nodes to do it. One is a, a mathematical node called Channel Booleans. That's going to do division for us. And the other one's a blur node. So stick with me here, because this is not as complicated as it might sound. So after the media in one, which if we take a look at the media in one right here, this basically, this whole picture here has detail information, and it also has color information. And the way frequency separation works is you separate those out. And the idea is we're going to basically just track the details um, rather than trying to track the color and the details. And we'll do that with first adding a shift space channel booleans, BOL node. Make sure you get the one with the S at the end. And we'll change the operation mode on this instead of copy to divide. So this is a blur divide technique. And I'll change the alpha to do nothing in case there was an alpha in it. There's not in this case, but that'll help us out. All right, so now what we need to do is get a node that's going to give us just the color information. And that's the blur node. So just any standard blur, shift space, B L U R. And we take the copy of the original footage. This is the great thing about nodes, right? We can take copies of our original media in. We don't have to Command-C and Command-V just by taking multiples from that output there. And if I load this in here, it doesn't have a lot of blur by default, but I can crank this as much as I need. And the more I do here, the more frequency separation I'm basically providing the image. So there, here's our color version of the image. Now, the correct order that we want to divide these to get the extract that detail is we'll take the blur copy, put that in the green foreground of channel booleans, and we're dividing out that blurred version, and we get this wild-looking image over here that is not going to do us anything for the composite, but it's going to give the tracker tool the information that it can use to grab onto that, that texture of the, the tree limbs, the tree bark right there. Let's take a look at the planar tracker tool. I haven't changed anything before, um, but now if I hit the track forward button, we should see, yep, sure enough, it has detail and information to get it completely uh, off screen. Well, almost completely off screen. It does get stuck at, what is this, frame 337. There's a few solutions to continue this on to get it off quickly. One would be to redraw the shape. But a quicker solution, um, especially when you need it rough, uh, would just be to go to the spline editor, spline tool up here, and then come down to track. And then you see there's all this tracking data here. We can do something that's called gradient extrapolation. And that will just continue the motion path of the last two keyframes that are in here. It'll continue this motion and the speed of it. So just right click anywhere in this chart down here, choose gradient extrapolation. And even though it doesn't add more keyframes, it does continue the motion of that path smoothly off screen. We don't really know if this tracking data is good until we check it. And I see this missed all the time on YouTube tracking tutorials. We have to check our track. And how do we check it? Well, we look at the stabilized version of it. And confusingly enough, I'm going to close my spline editor. The operation mode over here that's called stabilize is not how we actually look at a stabilized version of this for checking accuracy of the track. We actually use what's called steady instead. And the other thing before we go into here, I want to point something out. Our reference frame on here is set to frame 338. We also want to set a reference frame for our steady frame, which is going to allow us to check the track. So if I change the operation mode here to steady, 
and I change the steady time instead of zero because I don't have tracking data at frame zero. I have tracking data from frame 338 to, what is it, 404. So I'm gonna hit set, set right here. And this is basically the frame that everything kind of gets moved around and locked around. So what I can do to check the track is I just move in real close with my cursor. I park it, I lift my hand off the tablet or your hand off the mouse. I'm gonna hit space bar to play around. Actually, before you do that, um, make sure you load the planar tracker into the viewer. Channel Booleans right now is currently loaded. So I'm gonna pick and flick and drag my planar tracker into the viewer. Let's see, let's move my cursor over this little detail right there, that feature. And if I hit play and the thing stays smooth and it doesn't move around, we have a nice smooth track, which we do. Um, it gave us a really, really nice result. You can see there's no popping or anything like that. If there is popping, you can go and delete tracking uh, data like keyframes that are in the spline editor, or you just go back to figuring out a different shape or something else to track. But this has given us a really, really nice result that we can now export and actually apply. This tutorial is more about the frequency separation setup, but I will quickly show you how you can use this with a shape. So I'm gonna come back over to operation mode, back to track. That was, we just went to steady to, to check the track. But under the track tab, we have this amazing tool that's down here called create planar transform. And this basically bakes out those keyframes to a single transform tool that we can apply to any shape. Now it's based off of a reference frame. I'm gonna click this button, it's gonna sort of poop out a, there we go, it's got a, a planar transform tool that's pooped out and it's got all that information inside of here. And you'll see it, it does remind us, it has, says our reference frame was 338. So basically the idea is anytime I draw a shape on frame 338, it will follow the movement of the data that's in here. So one way we could use this, we're basically, essentially we're done with this over here. I only use the planar tracker and the frequency separation to create the data that's in this, this planar transform tool. So if we take a look at the original footage, that's what we actually want to work with. Let's say I want to draw a mask around the tree. Make sure you're parked on the reference frame, frame 338. I'll grab a B-spline tool from over here because no one uses B-spline tools, and I want to show you how that works. It's basically, it's like a polygon tool without having the two handles you have to always control all the time. And in fact, I'm going to go full screen because this window is tiny. I basically set my nodes in my keyboard customization to enable and disable by hitting Q on the keyboard so I can get a nice big view. I'm actually trying something out new today. I'm working left to right in the default view. It was suggested that I do that. I want to know, normally you see me work top down. Let me know down in the comments if you prefer me working this traditional left to right way. Um, but I found that I really need to disable my nodes anytime I'm drawing masks, which is a, a big part of the reason you would want to use Fusion. Um, but you can see this makes a nice smooth curve without even having to click and drag uh, around, uh, around uh, you know, the shape. Uh, Shift-O, that closes things up. If you want to come up here and, and change a point, what I suggest you do is you just click anywhere on here. That deselects everything. And then there's a secret. If you hold Option or Alt, it actually grabs. So I'm holding Alt and Option, whatever Mac or PC, and it grabs whatever your cursor is closest to. So you don't have to necessarily come in here real close and grab that point. So you can do that. And in fact, if you want to make that edge harder, you can do that with B-splines too. You just hold W for weight. And you can see that, that it's making that point harder so that it can be tucked up. So if I wanted to select this point down here instead, I might hold Option to select it, W, and I can make, make that point down there harder as well. I'm going to hit Q again, which is my toggle to just open up the nodes again. To actually apply this mask, which I suggest you draw this while not connected, is to plug this into the yellow uh, background input of the planar transform, not the mask. Okay, not the mask. Make sure you go into the yellow input of the transform. And what this has done is it's just applied that match move movement that we got out of the planar transform. So we can apply this as a mask however you want. And maybe it's a roto mask that you're using. Maybe it's something like a, a simple color correct. I'll just show that in here so you can we can get out of this tutorial and move on to the next one. But let's add a color correct node right after the footage. Go into here. So we're always just using the original footage. Let's make the tree pink, but only pink. Put this into the effect mask where I made this moving roto shape. And then we'll send this out to the color or the edit page. And you'll see it follows nice and smoothly. Now the reason you'll, you'll notice as it drifts off here, the reason it slips off there at the end is because I just did an XY. There's no scale or anything like that. And there's no rotation that's in, involved in this. But this has gotten us to a point where we can set fewer keyframes on the B-spline itself 
if it needs to be refined further. So let's say we're happy here on this frame, but by the time we get to here, you know, that's off too far. All you need to do is just lasso select those, hold option, drag those out, and it, you'll see there's a keyframe place there, a keyframe place there. And the computer's doing the math to interpolate between those two keyframes. And you kind of just divide and conquer. So maybe at this point it was over too far. I would select those, option, and just think about moving edges. Never think about moving points when you're doing rotoscoping. It's always about that edge. And then if you needed to, you can turn things like on the planar transform, there's a settings motion blur, which you can apply as well, as well as all kinds of softening tools to these. But hopefully you got the main gist of this tutorial, which is to use the channel boolean node and it is set to operation divide. And then you're dividing this right here. This is, this is the crutch. You're dividing the blurred copy from the original, which gives you this wild looking thing so that the planar tracker has something to grab onto. Hey, my name is Chadwick. This is Creative Video Tips. I teach all things about DaVinci Resolve, both advanced and for beginners. And because there's so much more to learn, I'll see you in the next video.